You know, as you begin a series like this, if you're like me, you kind of know the direction and you kind of plan out where you want to go. And uh, this morning, God got me because during praise and worship, God began to just whisper in my ear, tell my people who I am. They don't know. Tell them who I am. We have so marred the image of God and the concept of God that most Christians really don't understand him. If they did, they wouldn't be doing what they do That's right. and think that they could get away with it. Just a quick review, just in the last couple of weeks, we have discovered that God is the creator. He is Elohim. And if he's the creator, he's also the one who is the judge. That if he is my creator, I am answerable to him. And man seems to forget or wants to deny that he is answerable to anybody other than himself. We also discovered last week in the name of God, Yahweh Elohim, that God is the one who balances grace and justice for the sake of mankind. And really, whenever you see there, there are a lot of hyphenated words in, in the Word of God that uh, sometimes they go with a ger German pronunciation of Jehovah or Yehovah, that it's hyphenated. You're actually talking about Jesus because Jesus is encoded in the Tetragrammaton. And, it, and if we would take the time to examine every one of them, you would see an aspect of Messiah in those revelations of God. But I want to start out this morning in Genesis chapter 17. Verses 1 through 3. And this is a, a revealing, I, I think, more of bringing into clarity what God has already done in the life of Abram until this time. In fact, we're going to come back and visit this exact same scripture when we start just talking about halicha, of walking with God. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply, thy, and multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him. How would you like God to come up to you and say, I'm almighty God? And if you actually read it in the Hebrew, it was, if you notice in your King James Bible, the, the Lord, all capitals, that Yahweh, or Messiah, Jesus, came to Abraham and said, I am El Shaddai. And I want to I get into that because that, this is pivotal really in the life of Abram. When God called him, he was a citizen of Babylon. Not only was he a citizen of Babylon, he was an active participant in the worship of other gods. His father was an idol maker. And growing up in that household, what did he learn how to do? Make idols. And yet God calls him out of that system. And we need to understand that Babylon is a system. It was, the, it, it was put together by Nimrod for several purposes. He used it to turn, he began to hunt men and to draw them away from God by creating a system of commerce, a system of cities with walls, a system of that man no longer had to trust in God, he only had to trust in man. He had to trust in the system. Does this sound familiar, what's being put forth in the world today, in America today, that trust the system, you empower the system, and the system will take care of you. That's why socialism is only one step away from Luciferianism, is to draw men to God. We have a system of commerce that we will prosper you, that we will loan money, that we will do all these things, and, and, and doing that you no longer need to trust in God. You give man power. And then that man's supposed to take care of you. And before Abram could walk with God, he had to leave that system. Think about that for a minute. He had to leave the system. Now, we got a lot of believers today saying that we have a right to own that system. No, we don't. You leave that system. That's why the Bible says that when the blessings of God are on us, we will lend to many and borrow from none. 
because what you borrow from you are servant too. And if you depend on Babylon to meet all your needs, you become the servant of Babylon. And God has a higher purpose for us. And so in, in the midst of all this, and, and uh, you, you can kind of see in the journey of Abraham as we, cover, as we covered in covenant faith, that Abram is beginning to learn who God really is. And as he learns who God is, it begins to change Abram. He, 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 he goes from being scared and running down to Egypt and lying to the Pharaoh to a man who simply out of his own household took on four kings when they invaded Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, that, that's a great transition, isn't it? Because the more he discovered who God is, the more he began to discover who he was in God. And one of the reasons why believers are not able to stand in righteousness the way that they should, if you don't know God, you can never get a grasp of who you are in him. I need to put that back in my notes. That's not even in my notes. But that's good. If we serve a wimpy God that has been marred and disfigured by fleshly, carnal theology, and I'm supposed to be predestined to be conformed into that image, I become a, dis a, a, a disproportionate, distorted, wimpy man or woman. We become more like Jacob instead of Israel, that we are running after a blessing. How many know that when you walk with God, you do not have to run after a blessing? The blessings run after you. You are blessed to be a blessing. You see, when you're, when you're walking with El Shaddai, you don't have to worry about getting blessed. Because one of the first definitions of, of El Shaddai is the all-powerful one, the almighty one, the all-sufficient one. If you're walking with all-sufficiency, why do you need to worry about getting blessed? You know, Michael and I were talking just a little bit this morning. I remember, and I, I, I've, I've, been, I've been around long enough now to be around for a while, <laughs> Okay. I remember in, in the beginning of the, of the faith movement, the whole thing was about believing God and walking with God and not counting on the world. You walk with God. I remember hearing teachers of that saying, I, would, I will not beg for a preacher's discount. I won't even accept it. If they try to give it to me, I'm going to give them twice as much back because God's blessed me. Somehow, it flipped from that to the almost, almost like witchcraft of, okay, I'm waiting for you to bless me now because I'm walking with God. I've literally seen people walk up and said, I've been waiting for God for a new car. You're supposed to give me your car. No, that's witchcraft. That's not God. How about God blessing the works of your hands where you can go out and buy one? And I, and I see people moving in pseudo-witchcraft trying to position people to bless them. That's not walking with God. That's not faith. Well, how much is it not faith? Abram, Abraham at the end of his life, the one who found out about El Shaddai. At the end of his life, his wife has died. How many know that's, that's a time of grieving? And so the people round about come to kind of comfort him and one of the kings says, I'll, I'll give you this property. I'll give you this property to bury your wife in. Abraham humbles himself and says, not so. No, no, no. What's a fair price? And you kind of see the negotiation going down. Abraham pays twice the going price for the place to bury his wife. Because that's what a man of faith does. He also wanted to make sure that no one could ever say, well, that property was unlawfully taken when you pay twice as much as what it's worth. How many of that's arguments over with? Abram had discovered that when he went and, had, and, 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 and fought to get Lot back, and the king of Sodom and Gomorrah said, I'm going to give you all, the, all, all this wealth. And he said, no, let no man ever say he's made Abraham rich. 
You, you, you don't need that when you're walking with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You don't have to try to con people to give to you. You don't have to con to try to get the situation turned. God begins to supply your needs. And if he's got to rain it down from heaven or if he got to, he's got to move on somebody that you don't even know of, he will do it. But quit the games. Quit saying you're walking by faith and you manipulate people and you con people and you're trying to, you're using pseudo witchcraft to get your needs met. That does not belong in the kingdom. That's the way of Babylon. And there's too much of that going on in the body of Christ today. Well, Brother Mike, how does that go on? I'm getting a word. It's a $99 word. Those who, uh, 99 people need to give $99. And you're going to get 99 blessings. That's a con job. That is not of God. There was a guy who taught him biblical finances, and I thought he did the, the perfect job. He said, he says, now we're getting ready to take up the offering. Here's what you do. You ask God how much you're supposed to give. If he says nothing, put nothing in. If he says a dollar, you put a dollar. But here's the deal. For some of you, if he said put $10,000 in, you put $10,000. You don't give above or below what God says to give. You obey. Because the Apostle Paul says, let every man give according to his ability. According to his ability, according to his blessing. Not according to out of desperation. We have a lot of Christians that just try to throw money at God, believing for a, bless, believing for a miracle. Obedience brings the blessing. When you're walking with El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. Oh, we, we need to get that this morning. That God is the all-sufficient one. God doesn't have to reach over to an angel and borrow something to give you what you need. You're never going to, you, God's coffers are never going to be short. He's never going to worry about balancing the checkbook because he has you as a child. But he always does it with balancing grace and judgment. You can't con God. All the games have got to stop with God. You've got to be honest with God. And as you allow him to work on you, he begins to work through you. We're going to get into more of this when we start studying man. Because right now, everything in America, the way it's set up, the way we are set up as a nation, God cannot bless it. How can he bless the works of your hands when your hands aren't working? Just think about that for a minute. God cannot bless a consumer nation. He can bless a productive nation. And the Babylonian system, the way that we have done welfare and we're being pushed socialism, diminishes productivity which diminishes your own self-worth. I'm, I'm not going to wait a couple of weeks. <laughs> we got to get into that, but I need to get more into this El Shaddai. El is, is the short for Elohim. It means God, the mighty one. Uh, but the only true God, sometimes it can be used when, when men are mighty or, or, or men of rank, mighty heroes can also be called El in Hebrew. But the theological workbook of the Old Testament, I want, I want to read just a couple of segments out of this. It said, the rabbinic analysis of this word is that it is a compound word composed of the relative she or who and the word day, enough, she day, the one who is self-sufficient. God's self-sufficient. That he's the one, he doesn't need to borrow it for anybody to take care of you. But then it goes on to say, in recent times, these earlier suggestions have been all but rejected and new ones have been put in their place. We need to mention only some of the more tenable suggestions. One is that Shada is in connection with the Hebrew word Shadad to destroy, hence my destroyer. When God said, blessing, I'll bless you, cursing, I'll curse, you know, I'll curse them that curse you. That part of the concept of El Shaddai, if I need protection, he's the all-sufficient one. 
He is God, my destroyer. I know that's not tiptoeing through the tulips the way that most Christians like to with the preaching of grace, but how many know that when you're dealing with the devil, you need God the destroyer on your side? You need the one. Jesus was sitting. I mean, there's, there's scriptures that just come to mind. Jesus came forth to destroy the works of the devil. He came as El Shaddai, the destroyer, to destroy the works of the devil. And it took the cross to get it done, but he was all sufficient to raise himself up from the grave. He didn't need anybody to believe. The Father raised him from the dead. And they weren't gathered around the tomb saying, just any minute now, he's going to come up. Just any minute now, he's going to break forth. None of them believed it. The women were going to finish and it began to embalm him. How many know that's not belief when you're supposed to raise up three days later? It's not belief. Nobody on the planet believed if they would have, they'd have been standing outside the tomb three days later saying, this is really going to be cool. Nobody believed. But yet El Shaddai destroyed the works of the enemy when he rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. No one but him had to be in agreement with himself. That ought to be reassuring to you because how many of us have had times we, couldn't, we, we knew God was wanting us to do something or we were needing to go through something and nobody would stand really in agreement with us? They kind of say, it. oh, yeah, brother, I'm believing with you. You, you, can, you can hear, oh, that guy's a whack job. You know, it's whatever it is as they're walking away. All it takes is you to be in agreement with God when you're walking with him. Now, for those yet not walking with him, those of us that are can then come into agreement that God will do what he needs to do in their lives. And if two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst. But how many know that you and God are a majority? God is a majority all by himself. You're just coming in line with him. And it's not manipulating God to come in line with you. You cannot manipulate the immovable. God is immovable. He is unchangeable. You can't manipulate God. That'll actually get God to walk away. God's waiting for you to change to come in line with him. And then it begins to flow. Then it goes on to say that uh, a second possibility is this most widely accepted today as Shaddai is connected to the Akkadian word uh, Sadu or mountain. Thus El Shaddai would translate in English into something like God El of the mountain, i.e. God's abode. And I, I, I think it's, it's, it's facets of who God is, but I think they watered it down. He's no longer the destroyer. He's just the one who dwells on the mountain. But how many know that, well, yeah, he did dwell on Mount Sinai, but when they got into Israel and began to fight, and they said, let's, let's attack Israel in the valley because they served the God of the mountain, God of the mountain proved he was also God of the valley. He's the God everywhere. But we need to understand that when we walk with him and we do it his way, his way, he be, his all sufficiency begins to flow in my life. I like what Lillian Yeoman years ago said in one of her books. She, she dealt a lot on healing. And she said, whenever I begin to pray for healing and I'm not healed, I immediately begin to change. And, you, and she was a medical doctor. Early in the Pentecostal movement, back around 1900 or so. And what she found was if, if, if I'm praying and believing God for something and it doesn't come, I've either got to be doing the wrong thing or I've got to be in the wrong place. And therefore, I start seeking the face of God and repenting and, and needing to know what I need to change so that I find myself standing behind, by, right beside El Shaddai. If, he's way, if you're way off, he can't do what he needs to do. This walk with God is me standing right next to him. He, he's not supposed to have to holler for me. 
if I'm under the shadow of the Most High, he's got his arm around me and we're walking together. God is not supposed to be a distant friend. Jesus used a very specific word for the Holy Spirit, parakletos, which means the one called long aside, to walk with us. Let's look real quick to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, because we, we see El Shaddai in the midst of this promise. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I shall show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. And thou shalt be the fat, and thou, and thou shalt, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. When you're walking right with God, it's painful for those in the occult around you. Because if they curse you, El Shaddai raises up and becomes their destroyer. If someone blesses you, El Shaddai rises up and becomes a sufficiency in their life. Well, Brother Mike, why are we not seeing that happen more? Because we're not walking with El Shaddai. We have made a cardboard cutout that is palatable for our fleshly carnal nature. Because when you start walking with God, you got to change. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this. Let's go back and look real, again, real closely again at Genesis chapter 17. I'm going to show you a couple of things. When God said, I am almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect, he wasn't telling Abraham to tow the line because now you're walking with me, Jack, you better, you better tow the line. He was saying, I am El Shaddai, I am the all-sufficient one. Son, come walk with me and I will make you mature. Come walk with me and I will make you perfect. That word perfect does not mean without sin. It means to mature and for, for the really who God created for you to be, to reach its zenith, to reach its full maturity. And we see that in the life of Abraham. How many know that he, was, he didn't die the same man that he was when God called him out of Babylon? He got to the place where he could so walk with God that he was willing to give his only begotten son upon the altar for God on the doorway of this planet, Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is the doorway to this planet. Well, Mike, why are you saying that for? Because 2,000 years later, God gave his son on the very exact same spot and, and, and erected a doorpost and put the blood of the lamb over it. Abraham had, went to a, had started as a man who couldn't believe God through famine and had to go down to the worldly system to do it, got into a lot of trouble down there was scared of Pharaoh, to a man who was willing once he got the promise, he believed God so much that he gave his only son for God and it opened the door for salvation for all of mankind. How many know that's a different kind of man? We can become a different kind of man, a different kind of woman when we start walking with El Shaddai because he says, if you let me be your sufficiency... That destroys the need for self-esteem. You don't need other people to confirm you if the Almighty has confirmed you. Because, guys, and, and, and Mary will tell you this, there was a time, I, I may have to get some pictures when I was younger, because you, you, could spend, you used to be able to spend two hours reading my walls. From ceiling to floor, it was nothing but certificates and awards and degrees from ceiling to floor on all the walls. 
I've got, I've got, I'll have to dig it out and show you. Why? Because I didn't believe who I was. I didn't believe who I was. I had multiple doctorates and felt stupid. And I'm constantly looking for someone to affirm me. When I found out who I was in God, they all started coming down. I only got a couple of them hanging up there just because I'm supposed to be for the school, Dr. Lake. Do you know when you find out who Dr. Lake is, not when you see what's on his wall, but when you see how he lives and when he opens up his mouth behind the pulpit. Right. I, I, I don't need those things anymore because it is God. It is God who showed me who I can be in him, and I have been transitioning from glory to glory, from faith to faith, and I was here, but because I'm walking with him, I'm becoming who he knew all the time that I could be. But you only get there not because of what men do in your life, but because of your walking with God and what only he can do in your life. When you look to men, you, you become literally a black hole. Now, a black hole in, in, in uh, astrophysics is this anomaly in the universe that, it, that its gravitational pull and its hunger is so great, it will actually suck in light. It will swallow planets. It, will, it, can, it can literally swallow an entire solar system and never be satisfied. It will bend time and light round about it because it is a never-ending void that cannot be filled. That's the life of a Christian who has been wounded, who has not walked with God. And you will destroy everybody around you. Or as Tim Conway used to say, you're a wookalar. <laughs> One of the old Tim Conway movies. Suck your brain, dry out your nose, you know. <laughs> but they will, and they, they will suck the very life out of you, and when, and when nothing but dry bones fall to the ground... Their response is, well, you just weren't man enough of God enough to help me. Let me tell you something. You can't fill a hole that only God can fill. You can't do it. But if that person would ever really yield to the cross, take that black hole and nail it to the cross and say, God is my sufficiency, that whole thing begins to change around. Oh, this is not my notes, but it's still good. Want to go to the next one? Let's go to Psalms 23 and verse 1. Yahweh Rohai, Rohai. The Lord is my shepherd. Let's think about this with what we just learned about God. I'm, I'm trying to do it in a way that they build upon one another. El Shaddai is my ro'ai, is my shepherd. That ro'ai, ro'ai in Hebrew means to pasture, to tend, to graze, to feed, to teach, and to rule. Because the all-sufficient one is the one who tends over me. Because he is the one who watches over me. Because he is the one who is now my teacher, I shall not want. Now what is so neat about this word, this word, is, there's also a variant of it, uh, ro'i in the Hebrew. And the first time we see this is when, when Hagar is cast out. And the angel comes to her and says, you're not abandoned. God has a plan for you. And she says, I, I have seen El Roi. In other words, God sees. God sees. That's directly connected to Roi because, because God sees he can shepherd. Because God sees he can protect. Because God sees he can tend. He can rule over because he sees. It's talking about the omniscience of God, that, that God is not only everywhere, but God knows everything. And because he knows everything, he sees me. That's good. Let's not stop there. It so affected her that she named her son Ishmael, which means El has seen me. God 
God has seen me. He's shepherding me because he's seen me. How many people, the very heart of them is to cry out to be seen. I remember listening to a testimony of Tommy Walker when he went to, to Africa. They went to, I believe it was Africa, they went to an orphanage. And there was this little boy that he talked with that morning. And that afternoon, the boy comes back and says, do you remember me? Do you, do you remember me? It, his heart cry was for an adult because he had no parents to remember him. And Tommy said, yeah, I remember you. Called him by name. And all of a sudden, they rose up on the inside of him. Son, I remember you too. I've seen you. I see you. And because I see you, now if you're good, how many know that's good? If you're bad, that's still good. Because you can get corrected. Because he is the God who sees, not only if the Lord is my shepherd, he not only sees the sheep, he sees the goats, he sees the wolves, he sees the moles, he sees the gophers. He sees everything because he is my shepherd. But he's only my shepherd when I choose to walk with him. You can only, if, if I have the wrong concept of God in my, in my heart, I can't walk with him. That's why, that's why the Holy Spirit this morning says, Son, tell them who I'm. I may, I may spend another, I may just go the next 12 weeks and do nothing but who God is. Because we can never get who man is until we understand who God is. I'm just going to run this thing until God says that's enough. Because our concept of God is wrong. He is preached incorrectly from most churches and from most synagogues. He is preached incorrectly. He's been misrepresented. And therefore, it makes it impossible for us to walk with him. God systematically began to reveal more and more and more of himself to Abram until the place when he was 99 years old, God says, now you're ready to walk with me. Before it was visits, now it's a walk. How many of us have had God visit us? God's wanting to transcend the visits. He's wanting to get to the walk. That's when you don't need him to visit. Right. You know, Wouldn't it be crazy if I said, well, I think sometime next week I'm going to go visit Mary. No, there's something wrong here because I live with her. She puts the ugly and snuggy, okay? I... I I just don't feel right. If I, in fact, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm up here doing stuff for the ministry, I get to missing her so bad some days it's kind of rough anymore because I, I dwell with her. I walk with her. And, I, and when her presence isn't there, I feel something's missing. Right. Are you getting this, church? When God isn't there, right. you should feel like something's missing because you're walking with him. It's not a visitation. It's a walk. Because he is my shepherd. He is the one who sees me and knows me. And he knows me like I really am. And he chooses to love me and to give me the remedy for the bad parts of me that I am. The sin nature. Because he saw me, he came and dwelt among us and gave himself for us on the cross. Because he saw me. Oh. Because he said, listen, you need a shepherd. You need a shepherd. Your own rebellion loosed the butcher into the earth, but you know what? The only thing that can save you from the butcher is the shepherd. Let's go to the next one. Isaiah 15 and 26. And said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, Yahweh Elohim, and will do that which is right in his sight. Isn't that what he also told Abraham? Come on, walk with me, be thou perfect. I'm going I'm to teach you what is right in my sight and begin to do it. 
and will give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I brought upon the Egyptians. Now what's very interesting in Exodus here is that there are, there are two different tenses in the Hebrew. That word, I, I will not put upon you, really should be Exodus 15.26. What did I say? Did I say the wrong? Oh, I'm sorry. Exodus 15.26. Well, at least I know you guys are paying attention. Is there, there, are, there are permissive and causative tenses to the Hebrew. And literally this could, be, this could be translated, I will not permit the diseases to fall upon you that I placed upon the Egyptians. One's causative, one's permissive. You see, if I'm in covenant with God, the diseases aren't supposed to come to me. But if I don't hearken to his voice, if I don't keep his commandments and walk in his statutes, God has allowed, has got to allow them to come on me. But God's not going to put them on you if you're walking with him, but he's got to allow them for your disobedience. But he doesn't stop there. I am Yahweh Rapha. I am the Lord who heals you. Now, when we just look at this word Rapha in, in the Hebrew, it means to heal, to make healthful. What, what I like or find very interesting about it is it can not only be used for the individual, it can be used for the nation. I will come and heal their land. If my people who are called by my voice will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, I will come and rafa the land. I can restore the land. Let me tell you something. If the believers in America would out pray and outdo those trying to destroy our nation, God can begin the restoration process. What they have been working on for over a century is to so mar our concept of God within our minds that we will not humble ourselves and pray and turn from our wicked ways because in the last days they're going to call good evil and evil good. And we have a lot of the church calling evil good. So if you're calling it good, you can't turn from it, can you? You see how the, they, they tried to put us in a double bind. But yet this, this God is still Yahweh. Notice that's connected to Jesus, Jesus the healer. Rapha, the one who heals and restores. But, you know, sometimes in Hebrew, the words come about because they saw something or, or they heard something. The word Rapha comes from a sound. And I really tried hard to find, I couldn't find a picture of an, of an ancient loom, like they would take the wool and, and they would, they, 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 the old-fashioned way of making cloth. And as, it, as that thing would swish, as, as they would put line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, every time it went down, it went, Rafa, 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 Rafa. Every time they would make a garment, Rafa, Rafa. And literally was saying, I am the God who will line upon line knit you back together. Well, that needs to sink in. The enemy's got your life all messed up, got you to the place where you're at a curse instead of a blessing, got you at a place where sickness and disease, and let me tell you sometimes, sometimes sickness and disease, you know, as a naturopath, sickness and disease can come from the junk we eat. But it can also come from the stuff we do. It can also come from the stuff we believe. If you hold on to resentment and unforgiveness and move in darkness, your own body will begin secreting f chemicals that it begins slowly destroying itself. Or how about dying of a broken heart? 
something happened in life. And so all this stuff can be shattered. And God says, come. Guys, the price that Jesus paid on the cross. What did Judas do with the 30 pieces of silver? He went and bought the potter's field. Now, we don't, we, 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 we don't understand that. The potter's field, when, when vessels were broken that could not be repaired, they were discarded in the potter's field. It's also the field in which he drew the clay to make his vessels. Je the, the, the betrayal of Jesus, that 30 pieces of silver, purchased the potter's field so that the master potter could go in and repair all the vessels. That he could be Yahweh Rapha. You see, it doesn't matter to the extent of your brokenness. It matters of the skill of the potter. Oh, come on. It doesn't matter how broken you are. What matters is, is have you given all the pieces to the master? And see, that's, that's part of what happens when he cannot be Yahweh Rapha when I won't give it to him. I'm that stubborn, broken pot. God, I'm going to come to you on my terms. And he's saying, son, that's why you got a cracked head. <laughs> That's why you're broken, because I had to have it my way. And he said, no. He said, I can't repair you until I deal with your attitude. <laughs> and how many Christians, God can't, can't knit us back together because the only thing standing between us and healing is our attitude. Unforgiveness. Rebellion. I don't want to do it that way. God, I want to do it this way. What Isaiah's vision of the potter and the clay is, the only way the clay can ever do anything is it's got to be pliable. How I many know if you're working that loom and the wool and the materials you're using won't yield to the craftsman, the garment cannot be made. In other words, the only time that you can hear rafa is when total pliability is reached. Complete yielding to the hands of the master. That's why this scripture reads this way, guys. If you do what's right in my sight, if you hearken to my voice, if you do what's right in my sight to give ear to my commandments and keep my statutes, I'll become Yahweh Rapha. You might look like a ragtag bunch of folks right now, but if you yield to me, I'll restore what I had in mind from the very beginning of the earth when I thought of when I saw you. That's why the angel could come to Gideon and say, Ho, mighty man of valor, and Gideon went. <laughs> he was hiding in a wine vat. <laughs> <laughs> it's like no guy down the road I'm just hiding here in my wine vat trying to press out my stuff so the enemy don't take my stuff I'm here hiding as I take care of it so they don't see what I got but yet we find that when we answer the call of God God will begin dealing with you with where you're going to be not necessarily where you are now. And to be truthful, sometimes that has really uh, been confusing to Mary because she saw, she saw Dr. Goofball that quite didn't have his head straight yet. Guy was still working on him. And she'll say, I don't understand how you got blessed in that thing that you were trying to put together and you were trying to do much less not ending up just being a grease spot sometimes. Because, you know, she, it's, it's, a little, it's a little different being married to a prophetess, okay? That she, she can see, you know, just like, if I'm mad that day, I'm going to say, baby, I've had a bad day, I've been mad. You go, I know. You know. <laughs> uh, but she, she'd see that, and then she would see God bless and take care of it anyway. It's the same reason why God went down, or Abraham went down, 
lied about his wife, was, was going to give her to Pharaoh, and God snatched him up by the hair, whipped the Pharaoh up down one side to the other, and said, oh, by the way, all this stuff he gave you for your wife, you go ahead and take that and go back into the land. Why did he get away with that? Because God knew the man that he was going to become. Now, we have confused that with greasy grace, that I can get away. No, it's God knew your heart and that he would find out something about you, and so the next time you weren't going to do that. Next time you get word that four kings have went and got Sodom and Gomorrah, and you, and you, you would have let Sodom and Gomorrah go down the tubes if it hadn't been for you had family down there. And so you just, you've come to the place where before you were afraid, and I say, let's round up some boys, let's go down there and let's get him back. That was someone who knew they were God. You see, that, 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 that's the, when, when, when you allow Jehovah Rapha to knit you back together, you get some spiritual fortitude. You stop being afraid of everything except to have a reverential fear of the Almighty. Christians that are constantly afraid of everything, that everything puts them in alarm, whether it be any, anything from a storm to the economy, they've not allowed God to knit them back together. I've, I've got a daughter that has watched God deliver us out of a lot of things, and and Michael will testify. I mean, there'll be a storm and the windows will be rattled, and she'll wake up and she'll say, that all you got? I remember her as a teenager, we literally had, it was, a tornado was near where we were living, and we, Mary and I woke up and the walls were going like this. Get the kids! Let's get the kids! Let's pray! Steffi sat around for a while. She said, that's it. I'm going back to bed. She went back upstairs <laughs> in the middle of a windstorm and said, that ain't that bad. I, I'm going back to bed. That's, that, that doesn't come from her just wanting sleep. That comes from God's got this. God's got this. If he can stop an assassin, watch a windstorm. So many times we look at this just about healing the physical body. Did you know that healing your physical body is the easiest thing that God can do? The easiest. If you've ever worked on vehicles, replacing a part is really easy. But when you start having onboard computers and all these other things, to get everything to work in harmony where it flows like it's supposed to flow, now that can be a whole other different, you know, that's a whole different ball game. Because if that computer is wrong and messing up, you can have all perfected parts, all perfect parts, all having everything that they need, and the thing still won't run. And a lot of believers' lives won't run, not because of what's going on with their body, but because they've not allowed Yahweh Rapha to knit their souls back together. They've not allowed him to go back in and reinstall a proper operating system. Because the enemy came in with a virus and corrupted the system, and now the system is destroying itself. Did you know that there are computer viruses they can put on your computer that will cause the CPU to burn out? That will burn out and blow out parts of the computer? Because it pulls back the, the, the restraining things that keep them from getting overloaded. And it, I mean, if, if you've ever opened up your computer on the top of the CPU, there's a heat grill, then there's a fan. And the, the computer will down toggle when, when, that, when that CPU gets too hot so it don't burn up. They'll shut all that off and it'll just burn itself up. In the same way, sin takes back all the restraints and you end up burning yourself out. You end up burning yourself up. That you end up destroying your life faster than God, than you allow God to knit it back together. And God is saying, if you'll hear my voice, I got your original DOS. I, I got your original operating system that's encoded in my nature, in God's nature, in his commandments, in his statutes, in his ways. If you'll give ear to it, in other words, allow, allow more input of the good input then God could begin overriding the corrupted, flawed operating system that Satan installed in your heart with the lies he gave you. And God says, as part of that knitting you back together, 
if I, if I can get you back together, I don't have to allow the diseases that came upon Egypt to come on you. Yeah, that's right, that's right. I don't have to allow it. Because yeah. you give no open door to it. Now, does that mean that we're going to never have a problem? No. How many know having your nephew taken by four kings is a problem? When you're walking with God, you move from a problem creator to a problem solver. It's like a man or woman of faith that they begin having a physical problem can either run, uh, oh, please pray for me, oh, please pray for me, or they'll say, God, give me a plan of action. What, what do I got what, what to repent of? What, how do I got to change my diet? How do I got to begin rearranging things in my body? Show me what I need to do so that you can begin knitting this area of my life back together. That's a man or woman of faith. The other is a man or woman of panic. Well, Mike, are you saying that anytime anybody asks somebody, is that panic? No. But, I mean, you can see panic. And people that don't walk with faith, you can see panic. Let me know that we need to recognize the gift of healing. When that's there, it helps put things back together. But I think we're always looking for the physical when a lot of times when that anointing comes, God can begin restoring the soul, which will cause the body to fall in place. But what we have seen, and I, I studied the healing revivals, and uh, I, don't, I, I think a lot about those people. I, I, I appreciate them. I've had a lot of people, you know, badmouth Oral Roberts and others. You've not seen the old crusade photos. He paid a price. And when you stand there and you have been praying for people for 12 hours, he would stand so long that they would probably put him in a chair. And his own staff would say, do you need to use the restroom? I mean, after 12 hours, <laughs> Brother Roberts, just, just, Get, get something to eat. You've you, you got to take care. Get, get something to drink. And he would look at the sea of people and just begin crying. He says, I can't. There's so many people that still have a need. And yet God, they allowed God to heal their bodies. But they didn't allow God to heal their souls. And so many of them, although they received a supernatural healing in their bodies, within four or five years it had come back. Because there was not a restoration of the soul. They didn't forgive. They just thought that God healed them so they could watch football and watch TV and not get in the Word and gripe and complain and cause conflict in the church, not realizing that God says, I hate those who spread discord among the brethren. And they begin spreading discord among the brethren. What they sow, they also reap, and they end up right back where they were. We've got to ask ourselves this morning, am, am I really allowing... Almighty God, to be El Shaddai? Am I choosing to walk with him by lining up with him and not trying to get him to line up with me? Am I allowing him to be my shepherd? Allowing, I realize that he sees I can't hide. And if I can't hide, God, let's deal with it. Let's just deal with it. The only one I'm lying to is myself if I don't think you see it. And God, because you see it, because I'm walking with you, you're becoming my sufficiency. You can see it all, and you begin shepherding me. Now, I just become pliable in your hands so that I can begin hearing that loom in my heart that he becomes Rafa, Rafa. And with every line, something's beginning to form. With every new layer, of what God is doing. I don't know what I'm going to be yet, but hold on, we'll eventually see it as I just stay yielded to the hand of God. I, I stay yielded to where I'm going to hear his voice. I'm going to walk in his commandments and statutes, and when something in my operating system is opposed to what he's saying, I crucify it with Christ and let the command of God overwrite the corrupted files in my heart. And as I do... God says, I got another, whichever metaphor you want to use, another line in the garment or another line of code, he's finally gotten down on your hard drive to get you to where you're not going to destroy yourself. Because he's got something in mind, folks. He's got something in mind. 
so much more than what you can imagine. So much more. But you've got to yield. You've got to yield to him. Why? Because he's your manufacturer. He's your creator. He's your creator that chose to deal with you not just based upon judgment, but based upon grace. He chose to become Yahweh Elohim when he made man instead of just Elohim. Oh. I, can, I can still see. I wish, I wish we could see. I'm going to end with this. I wish we could see the devil. When all he ever knew was Elohim. And now he, he starts messing with God's kids. And God says, I am that I am. That's what Yahweh means. And he went, huh? Where did grace come from? I didn't get none. I didn't see any of that in heaven when I was there. All I saw was the creator. And I chose to come against the creator. And I got bopped. I didn't get no, I didn't get no promise of nothing. Except I've got judgment hanging over my head. And no matter what I do, it is still there. I can, get, I, can, I can tempt all mankind to fall with me, and I know that I'm never going to win. I just, my desire is just to take as many of them to hell with me as I can. That's all I can ever hope for. And yet Almighty God comes up to them and says, i got a promise for you. That I now reveal myself as Yahweh. And God chose to extend his grace. That's why we can walk with him. That's why he can mend us back together. That's why he can see us and still be our shepherd. <laughs> he can see us and still be our shepherd. He said, you may look like a goat right now, Mike, but give me a chance to work on them horns. Give me a chance to work on your attitude. And I can, when I get done with you, you're going to be the sheep that I always knew that you could be yielded to the shepherd. I not only want to be yielded to the shepherd, I want to be the shepherd's pet. Oh, anybody ever have a bunch of animals? One's a pet. It's because it gets a new name. Gets a new name. If you read the book of Revelation, who overcomes, I'll give a new name just between me and you. You know, that's, that's, that's when you can become a sugar rooney or whatever, you know. <laughs> you, you get this new name. Because you become the shepherd's pet. You know what? If Jesus had his own way, all of us would get new names. All of us. That's his desire. Father God, we just yield this morning. Father, I hope that I've expressed this portion of who you are this morning and that I have restored the image of God within our consciousness. Father, we come to you as El Shaddai. We come to you as, as Yahweh Rohai, the, the one who sees us and shepherds us. And Lord, most of all this morning, we come to Yahweh Rapha, the one who knits us and molds us back the way we should be, Father. Father, I ask that you would loosen anointing in this place this morning to restore souls, to restore our lives. Father, to restore lost time the enemy has stolen that makes us feel like we're so behind the curve. But Father, you can restore that and you can make us who we need to be in this hour if we yield. And Abba, we yield this morning. We yield spirit, soul, and body to Elohim, our creator, this morning because of what Messiah has done for us. Lord, have your way. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Not just in this service, but, Father, during this week, if we need to let go of something, whisper in our ears to let go. Father, if we need to forgive, whisper in our ears who, what, when, and where. 
Lord, we want to forgive in the right place at the right time and the right person. Father, our hearts long to feel your hands upon us, molding us and knitting us back together. And our spirits long to hear Rafa beginning to flow from heaven as you begin to restore. Begin to restore us into that which you had in mind at the very creation of this universe, Lord. We ask that you begin making it so in such a real way in our lives because we have discovered a part of who you are. We thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name.